Yes, so I want to talk to you about financial grade APIs. And it's important because if you think about where OAuth and OpenID Connect started, it was really about securing comments on blog posts. And now we're talking about enterprises. So it's a whole other class of security. So we need to understand what OAuth and OpenID Connect do and what they bring and how we can go from commenting on blogs to actually protecting financial data. Because the way we put all these different standards together uh, for that class of, of problem is quite different. So here's a list of techniques. If you're gonna snap any photos of the presentation, this is probably the one. So this is your catalog of things that you can do uh, in your uh, OAuth implementation to provide financial grade security. So we got mutual TLS constrained tokens. I'm gonna talk about that uh, a bit here in a sec. We got proof key for code exchange or Pixie. We've got uh, interactive user consent and how we can actually make sure that the users are authorizing uh, access to their data. We've got signed request and response objects, pairwise synonymous identifiers. So I'm gonna talk about all of those in this talk. Uh, the other talk that I almost brought up was about phantom tokens, uh, but I'm not gonna give that one. Uh, but you can hear Daniel, he talked about it, Jakob mentioned it, and there's some, some uh, uh, different uh, videos in the archive we can talk about, or you can see. Strong authentication is important for providing financial grade uh, APIs, like actually uh, multi-factor, uh, and using strong credentials that, with identity proofing. I won't have time to go into that. Uh, and there's also uh, pre uh, prefix scopes and dynamic clients. So that's pretty much your, your, your gamut of techniques and technologies that you have to go from like commenting on blogs to uh, financial grade APIs. So let's drill in a few of these uh, time permitting. So mutual TLS constrained tokens. Before I like bombard you with a bunch of mutual TLS stuff, let's talk about the two main vulnerabilities of OAuth. It's uh, bearer tokens and it's the redirect. So those two things are what uh, are the, the primary attack vectors in OAuth. So bearer tokens, those are like, um, like bearer bonds. Like if you bear the bond, then you can spend the money, right? Like the, the heist movies, uh, the bank robberies, they're trying to get these, these bearer bonds of like, you know, million dollars for each piece of paper and then they can, they can you know, have a great life. So the, if you have a bearer bond, if you steal some bearer bond, then, then you, you bear it, you have it. So a bearer a bear access token is if you have the token, you're, you're that user. Uh, so, so that's like the Achilles heel, because if I can snatch someone else's token, I can become them. So what we want to do is we want to do the opposite of that, which is we want to have some sort of token that is tied to the, one, to the entity, the person to whom it was issued. Uh, and the opposite of then a bearer token is what's called a holder of key token or proof of possession token. Uh, and that's what mutual TLS constrained tokens are. So let's, let's look at these. Um, this is how mutual TLS uh, constrained tokens work. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, even though yesterday in my workshop, one of the students said, oh my God, that's insanely hard. Um, the, way, the reason I say it, it's relatively simple at least is because it follows similar patterns, like Yaka was talking about this morning. It's like if you just unpeel it a little bit and you can see that it's the same pattern. If you ever worked with SAML, it's the same exact pattern for doing uh, the SAML proof of possession uh, profile. So what is it though, if you don't have that frame of reference? So the way it works is we have some sort of client application and it will do a, some sort of flow, uh, code flow typically, uh, to figure out who the user is. So there's a process of identification of the user, the strong authentication, which I talked about, and then you get back to the client application and you have some sort of one-time usage token that represents that the user actually authorized or allowed this application to do things on their behalf. So now it's like the app is sitting there with this, this memento, this token, and it's gonna make an API call to the, to, to the OAuth server. Uh, I put Curity's logo there, but that's any OAuth server. So this, this right here is done over mutual TLS. So the client has a key that only this client has, and it's signed by a certificate authority that this OAuth server trusts. So this tunnel here is set up at authenticating the client and authenticating uh, the OAuth server. So each of these entities knows who the other is. And then up here in the OAuth server, as it issues a token, it puts a hash of the X509 certificate used in that mutual TLS uh, connection into the token that's minted, okay? And it checks also that the OAuth client, uh, who this one is claiming to be, is configured to be able to use the certificate that's being uh, provided in this tunnel. And if it is, it puts that, that hash of the, of the certificate in there, returns the token, and then the API call is made, 
And then in that API call, that's also done over mutual TLS. So that means that this client has to possess a key that it's still in possession of when it makes the API call. So the API side over here, what it's going to be able to do is, is look inside of that token, find that hash of the, the original uh, certificate, compare it with a hash of the one that was just used to call that API, and see that they're the same one. If they are, then what that means is the, the, the entity calling that API is the same one to whom the token was issued. So now it's, it's, it's not a bear bond. It's not a bear token anymore. It's, it's one where it, the entity has to prove possession of a secret, of a key. Uh, a key here that's used to do mutual TLS on this leg and mutual TLS on that leg. Okay, makes sense? If you have questions, uh, save them for me at the end or grab me afterward. But basically, this is how it works. Like I just said, client authentication using certificates. In the HTTP stream, we've got the client ID uh, as in a normal um, OAuth flow. The client ID is configured to use a certain DN in the OAuth server. Uh, if it matches the one that's provided, thumbprint is, is created of that put into the, the delegation or into the, the tokens that are minted. And then during token or introspection, I didn't show the introspection flow, but uh, in the token or the introspection, we have the hash of that so that the API uh, provider, the API, uh, can actually verify that the one calling it with those tokens is the same one to whom the tokens were issued. Another example of how we can go from bare tokens to proof of possession tokens is something called Pixie. So in Pixie, what we, we have is a, a vulnerability that exists in the callback. Remember I said the two vulnerabilities, bear tokens and the, the redirects? So in the redirect, what can happen with a client, if, if that callback is not uh, confidential, if it's not done over TLS, uh, and if it's possible for a bad actor to intercept the um, credentials, or if there's no authentication done on the token endpoint, and thirdly, if the callback is not unique per client, or at least per client operator. Uh, there does exist a vulnerability where this authorization code can be stolen. This authorization code represents uh, me delegating my rights to this application. So if someone can grab that code and present it as me, then that attacker can become me. Uh, and so all the strong authentication that we just did, all this fancy identity proofing that cost us a lot of money, is all completely like sidestep by just at the very last mile here, the last. Uh, six inches, we, we become that, that user. So we want to protect this. Uh, and this often comes up in mobile applications because in web-based applications, the redirect is over TLS uh, and, and, and it's harder to get the credential. So it very often comes up in mobile. To see how this happens, let's look at this flow diagram where a legitimate application will start the authorization request that will uh, call through to the OAuth server. The authorization server will return that code, that one-time usage authorization code, uh, and then it will be in, grabbed right here in step four. So on that callback, this is not then sending the callback to the legitimate application, but to the malicious one. And then if the, the malicious application has been able to, like through a proxy or f some other means, stolen the credential, the client ID and the secret, it can redeem that code uh, as the uh, legitimate application. And the OAuth server has no idea that it's actually a, a malicious application, so it will return the tokens. And this token will then allow uh, this application to call APIs uh, on behalf of the user of that application. So what we can do is we can add a step zero into this to prevent this. And this step zero is, works similarly to the uh, certificate constraint tokens in that the legitimate application uh, has, will, will use a proof key to prove that it is the actual application that starts this flow. And the OAuth server will refuse to finish it unless that proof is, is verified. So the way it works is in step zero, we create a secret key that's used just for this authorization request, and we hash it. The hash is sent during the authorization request. That's stored by the token server. Code is returned. When the code is sent up uh, with the stolen credential to the authorization server, it's missing the, the secret. And so an error is returned to the malicious application, and it no longer gets the, gets the tokens. Uh, the legitimate application would have access to that, that secret and would be able to provide it in that last step. So it and only it would receive uh, the tokens. I won't say much about interactive user consent uh, to provide banking grade security. 
Um, what I'm talking about is this final step in the authorization flow, which honestly you don't often see uh, because you, you give consent through like an employment agreement or terms of service or a software license agreement. Uh, but sometimes you do see it, especially when the OAuth server and the um, application are built by different organizations, different providers. The thing that I want to uh, refer you to is, is a talk I gave at Nordic API's uh, platform summit about the UX part of consent, if you're interested in that. But the thing that we've been learning in the last six, nine months uh, a lot about on consent is to do a digital signature over this. So you're, you're asking the user to consent to allow them to, uh, like a different application to access your account information. It'd be great to get a digital signature over everything that was actually being consented to, so you have that and can store that and persist that, uh, so that in, in even five years, ten years from now, uh, you have a record of that, that the user saw this information, this is how they were logged in, it was this client, these are the rights that they were delegating, this was the time of day, all of this stuff packed up into a, uh, like a JSON web token or some other sort of uh, uh, object that the end user ends up doing a digital signature over. That's banking grade. So let's also talk about request um, signing and response objects. So uh, important in banking grade, uh, even, you know, not, I'm not, when I say banking grade, I'm not just talking about banks either, you know, I'm talking about healthcare, I'm talking about government, I'm talking about, you know, high security. So in this, we need to make sure that there's no malware installed in the browser, in the user agent, because most of these OAuth flows go through the user agent. So how do we know that they're not being tampered with in flight. The way we do this is we sign the request from the client, send to the server and back. So we have some information here like the client identifier scopes and some additional metadata perhaps that the client application wants to make sure is never tampered with. So it puts that into a JSON web token, it signs that and it sends it over in uh, the request parameter, so like on the query string. Uh, and then you have that jot there. So the OAuth server will be able to see that, validate that signature, see that it hasn't been tampered with by any, any malware or any um, malicious actor in the middle. So then it could present that information, and then if you combine that with what I was just talking about with digital signatures, you've got like the whole way. There's no way that this could have been tampered with uh, in flight. We've got a signature over that uh, presented to the user, and then uh, uh, we can persist that. So we can also sign the response that's sent to the, back to the client as well, so the client will know that nothing was tampered with on, on the way back. All right, let's talk about pairwise synonymous identifiers. Uh, besides being hard to spell, uh, a synony pairwise synonymous identifier means like a random user ID that's created. Uh, so some unguessable user ID that uh, will be given to the client application instead of like their, their real name or their social security uh, number. And, and this is important so that different applications can't start tracking what, different what the same user is doing on different client applications. So the pairwise, and that means the pairing of the user uh, and the client and the, um, uh, the OAuth server. So uh, the actual user ID uh, is never shared with any of those client applications, just some random unguessable ID. And we can group clients if we need to, because sometimes we, we, clients do need to know uh, that it's the same user, not necessarily uh, needing to know their social security or their name, but at least that it's the same user so that they can uh, store information about that user within their sort of grouping or their domain or their sector. So we need a, a way of doing this uh, pairwising across the group of clients. So let's look at this, how it works. We've got some, some user, Alice. Uh, when she logs into Cloud App 1, she, we don't, the OWL server doesn't tell her that it's, it's Alice, but just some random ID. Uh, later on, when she logs into WWW1, some other client, she gets a, a, a different random user ID. And now what happens is that this one, this operator of this application can't go to this one and say, hey, what was Alice doing at your website? What was she doing at your cloud service? And build up a profile on her like that. Uh, so by just giving a random ID, they, they, they can't collude like that. So the pairing is between the client and the, the OAuth server. So what happens when you actually do need to uh, have some, some um, okay collusion? 
uh, like in this case where uh, we have a, a cloud application perhaps and, and a mobile application. And these need to know that it's the same user so they can see like what services were bought or what, uh, what has been subscribed to. Uh, in neither case do they need to know Alice's real identity, but they at least need a stable identifier so they, they, can, they can track that, that user uh, within that group. So you just put them in what's called a sector and then they'll receive the same identifier whereas other applications in, in uh, the other sector or uh, other groups will continue to receive different identifiers. So this is privacy by design. This is helping to ensure that uh, we, we can't be tracked across. And in, in banking grade, uh, this is definitely something you want to be thinking about. Phantom tokens, I guess I will talk a little bit about phantom tokens and this presentation after all, it's hard to resist. Uh, phantom tokens, the way it works is we have some sort of memento, some sort of opaque reference token that doesn't have any user identification in it at all. It's just a GUID or something like that, some random uh, string that represents that the user has logged in and authorized the client. And typically, uh, in any large-scale deployment, you won't call an API directly, but you'll go through some sort of gateway or proxy. Uh, and that reverse proxy has the chance then to dereference that uh, uh, one time or that memento token, uh, that opaque token, into a by value token like a JSON web token. So we can do that conversion within the reverse proxy. Uh, we can cache that in the reverse proxy and then forward it. And the reason that we would do this uh, in financial grade APIs are a few. So one is we end up with a smaller regulated space because the front end applications, the websites, the mobile applications, they never see any personally identifiable information so they don't have to be uh, regulated. So this is like what we were all doing in PCI compliance is we were putting gateways in front of it and then they would turn the credit card into not really a credit card and then you know, all of that didn't have to be regulated and comply with PCI. So it's the same idea that we've been doing before uh, but applied to OAuth and OpenID Connect. So we end up with a smaller regulated space and it's also not possible for the client to access any PII because it's not even there. The alternative is that we could use a, an encrypted JSON web token but then we're putting uh, the, uh, the decryption inputs into the hand of attacker and saying, I dare you, I dare you to decrypt this, and if you do, uh, then you'll have access to this PII. So it's, it's a, uh, there are alternatives, but they're, they're not as safe uh, as the, the uh, phantom token approach. Also, the other is that we don't want the front end applications to build a dependency on information in the token. So the token is for API access. If it finds all these goodies in here, like my social security number, my shoe size, my hair color, all this stuff, it might start doing something with that. And then when the API wants to change and remove that from the access token, now the front end is, is broken. So we have different tokens for the front end. That's the ID token. And we have the access token for the back end. So we don't need to have any of those claims, any of those user attributes uh, in that access token. So we shouldn't. It's vendor neutral and standard compliant. If you wanted to talk about caching and, and performance of it, we can also talk about that. Uh, but I don't have time in this talk. So in summary, mutual TLS and proof key for code exchange, great ways to ensure that we um, are protected against bear token vulnerabilities and also redirect vulnerabilities. Uh, get user consent and do better yet do a digital signature over that and preserve it. Don't use actual user IDs, but use PPIDs and use the phantom in token approach. And I've got two minutes and 30 seconds, so I'm going to do something off, completely off topic. I'm going to show you that, guys, this. This is something we've been working on uh, called OAuth Tools. It's a little blurry there. Uh, but what this is, is a, a sort of playground for you to learn about how OAuth and all this stuff works together. So if you're not building financial grade APIs, this part at least applies to you where you could sit here and, and go and say, I want to start a new flow, uh, like a uh, code flow or something. I can say, uh, click to client credential flow. I want to learn how that one works. Uh, pick a client, I can pick a client. You could think of this as like Postman, but for OAuth only. Uh, so now I do the client credential flow and I see an access token. I can introspect this. Uh, this works with any OAuth server that you have out there. Just go in there and configure it, uh, create a new environment. You can use Webfinger, you can uh, discover your uh, API server or your OAuth server settings uh, and start to work with that there. And then you can switch and, and uh, bounce between those different environments to do hybrid flow, code flow, client credential flow, implicit flow. You can decode JWT tokens, of course, uh, all this other stuff. So I just wanted to also tell you about this great learning tool for discovering more. Uh, so unrelated to this, however. So just to finish, I want to say thank you for all of your time and for listening.